Um, Heavenly Father, as uh, we come to this passage of your scripture, um, it is with some uh, shaking and trembling that um, I stand up here, uh, knowing that I'm speaking your words. Uh, Father, thank you for your scriptures. Thank you that you have given them to us uh, in form that we can understand and read and take in. Um, Father, might each of us um, hear your word today in a way that changes us forever. Amen. How long, O oh Lord? Until when, God? Have you ever found yourself saying that? Man, I have. Many of you know, know the troubles that I and my family went through four or five years ago, and along with asking why, these waiting questions were asked many, many times. How long will it take? When will all this end? And of course, for many months now, we've all been asking, when will this drought end? When will it rain? So we're all familiar with waiting, aren't we? Well, this morning I want to help you wait. I want to help you wait well. I want to point you to someone who Isaiah saw and changed his life forever. Knowing him properly will help us to wait confidently. Now, I want to say up front that just because I'm preaching on this passage, Uh, and I'm drawn to the topic of God's holiness, that doesn't mean that I am therefore a holy man. In fact, as I have prepared and even as I drove to town this morning, I've become aware that the reason I have a deep hunger to learn of the holiness of God is because I'm not holy. I've tasted just enough of God's holy majesty to want more. I don't think that we can read this chapter often enough. Now, the word holy means to divide, to mark off, to separate apart from all else. Our English root refers to that which is complete and whole. And when used of God, holiness is that which divides God from everyone and everything else. God's holiness refers both to his majesty and to his moral purity. Uh, From Genesis to Revelation, God is referred to as holy and we could call God's holiness his transcendent attitude, sorry, attribute, because it runs through all the rest. His justice is a holy justice. His love is a holy love. His power is a holy power. As we approach the celebration of Jesus' first coming, Let's admit that we don't really understand God's holiness like we should. Isaiah knew of the concept of God's glory and holiness, but it wasn't a reality for him until he came face to face with him. And it affected the way that Isaiah waited and what he looked for. And surely it should affect us as well as we wait. Um, Toza said it like this, We know nothing like the divine holiness. It stands apart, unique, unapproachable, incomprehensible and unattainable. The natural man is blind to it. He may fear God's power, even admire his wisdom, but his holiness he cannot even imagine. So in order to help us focus on waiting well in Advent, as Isaiah did, It's unpacked chapter 6. So if you haven't already, please turn there. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a high and lofty throne, and the hem of his robe filled the temple. Seraphim were standing above him. They each had six wings. With two they covered their faces, With two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. And one called to another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of armies. His glory fills the whole earth. The foundations of the doorways shook at the sound of their voices, and the smoke was filled with temple. Sorry, the smoke filled the temple. No, the temple was filled with smoke. I was reading ahead. Then I said... Woe is me, for I am ruined, 
because I am a man of unclean lips and live among a people of unclean lips and because my eyes have seen the king, the Lord of armies. Then one of the seraphim flew to me and in his hand was a glowing coal that he had taken from the altar with tongs. He touched my mouth with it and said, Now that this has touched your lips, your iniquity is removed and your sin is atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord asking, Who should I send? Who will go for us? I said, Here I am, send me. And he replied, Go, say to these people, Keep listening, but do not understand. Keep looking, but do not perceive. Make the minds of these people dull. Deafen their ears and blind their eyes. Otherwise they might see with their eyes and hear with their ears, understand with their minds, turn back and be healed. Then I said, Until when, Lord? And he replied, Until cities lie in ruins without inhabitants, houses are without people, the land is ruined and desolate and the Lord drives the people far away, leaving great emptiness in the land. Though a tenth will remain in the land, it will be burned again. Like the terebinth or the oak that leaves a stump when felled, the holy seed is the stump. Isaiah is called a major prophet because of how much he wrote and how often he is quoted in the New Testament. He was a statesman who spoke for God to common people and also to royalty. He prophesied during the reign of four kings over a period of about 60 years, and these were filled with political controversy, moral decadence and religious indifference. Sounds a bit like 2019, doesn't it? One of the better kings was Uzziah. He reigned wisely and well for more than four decades. He was able to turn Jerusalem into a fortified city and gave the people a great sense of security. But the story of Uzziah ends on a sad note, according to 2 Chronicles 26, verse 16. When he became strong, he grew arrogant and led to his own destruction. He acted unfaithfully against the Lord his God by going to the Lord's sanctuary to burn incense on the incense altar. Because he arrogantly claimed for himself the rights that God had given only to the priests, God struck Uzziah with leprosy. He was removed from his throne and he spent his remaining years outside of Jerusalem. In spite, though, of the shame of his later years, when King Uzziah died, it became a time of national mourning and tremendous uncertainty. In the same year that his earthly king died, Isaiah went to the temple, presumably to find some consolation, some comfort. Well, he got a whole lot more than he bargained for, didn't he? One of the best ways for us to understand holiness is to see how holiness affects the unholy. Meeting God is never a casual event, and it certainly is not boring. In the context of an empty earthly throne and the uncertainty that went with that, the first thing that Isaiah saw was the Lord's majesty. Verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a high and lofty throne, and the hem of his robe filled the temple. The word Lord is the title Adonai, which is a reference to his absolute sovereignty as King of Kings. Isaiah had lost his human hero, and in the process he found the Holy One. To be high and lifted up, or sorry, to be high and lofty, or lifted up, or exalted, means there is nothing above God. He is at the very top. He is in first place. So Isaiah is saying something like, in the year that we lost our human king, I saw the real king, the king of kings. There's no reason to panic, is there, when God is on the throne? It might have looked to Isaiah as if everything was falling apart, but actually the Sovereign One was holding all things together. 
His kingship is infinitely superior to that of Uzziah or anyone else. Even David and Solomon at their greatest had nothing to compare with the one sitting on this throne. In the midst of this chaotic time, God makes a personal appearance. He comes down. It's hard, but I hope you can imagine what it must have been like for Isaiah to see the Lord high and exalted with the train of his robe filling the temple. Watching brides come down the aisle is one of life's joys, isn't it? Some have a train of their gown flowing behind them to magnify the splendour. When Princess Diana got married, her train was seven and a half metres long. But in 2012, a bride from Romania had a train that was three kilometres long. Yes, three kilometres. It took ten seamstresses a hundred days to make it. But even that train has nothing on the train of God's robe that filled every section of the heavenly temple. It probably doesn't mean much to us today, but in Isaiah's time, the length of someone's train was an indication of status and importance. Well, there is no one of higher status or more importance than God. Isaiah describes what he saw next. Seraphim were standing above him. They each had six wings. With two, they covered their faces. With two, they covered their feet. With two, they flew. The seraphim aren't mentioned anywhere else, only in this passage. And they are most certainly not sweet, chubby babies with wings. The word seraphim literally means fiery ones. There are a certain group of angels whose personal calling was to attend to God's holiness, to praise him. They covered their faces because they were in the presence of his holiness. They were sinless, eternal creatures made by God and given the task of calling attention to the holiness of Almighty God. And yet they cannot look upon him, upon his glory. Remember Moses on the mountain begging to God to show him his glory? God hid Moses in a cleft in the rock and would only let him see his back as he moved past. It's not that God didn't want Moses to see him, but Moses would not have survived. As it was, he radiated God's glory, his face shining frighteningly to the Israelites when he went back. But the most incredible thing about them is not their appearance, as amazing as that is, but their message. They cried out back and forth in adoration in verse 3. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of armies. His glory fills the whole earth. When we want to emphasise the importance of something in English, we underline, we use italics or bold type or capital letters. We might then follow it with an exclamation point or two or maybe a young emoji if we're young and cool. The Jewish people used repetition when they wanted to emphasise something, but usually only twice. So to say a word three times in succession is to elevate it to the highest degree. When the angels say, holy, 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 they are emphasising the breathtaking splendour, the infinite nature of God's holiness. Did you know that this is the only attribute of God that is repeated three times? The Bible doesn't say God is love, 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 or light, 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 or mercy, mercy, mercy. But it does say that he is holy, holy, holy. Now look at the last phrase of verse 3. The whole earth is full of his glory. God's glory is God's weightiness in wonderful qualities such as might, beauty, goodness, justice and honour. When it comes to these characteristics and so many other good characteristics, God has them in superabundance. So when we think of God's glory filling the earth, we need to remember that God is the most significant thing in the whole universe. He spoke it into being. He has all good things in greater quantity and greater quality than we can even imagine. And God's glory is solid and substantial. It isn't mere reputation. It isn't dependent on anyone or anything else. God's glory reflects his essential nature. 
Now look down at verse 4. The foundations of the doorway shook at the sound of their voices and the temple was filled with smoke. The entire temple begins to tremble. It's like an erupting volcano. And smoke is an indicator that he is in the purifying presence of God. This is a manifestation of his tremendous majestic holiness, much like the glory cloud that was with the Israelites in the wilderness. Once Isaiah, once we get a sense of God's majesty, we must see and we must then confess the miserable position that we are in. Look what Isaiah said in verse 5. Woe is me, for I am ruined, because I am a man of unclean lips and live among a people of unclean lips. And because my eyes have seen the king the Lord of armies. What was Isaiah's reaction when he came face to face with God's majesty? Well, it wasn't boredom and yawning. He started yelling, Woe is me. Now, on the lips of a prophet, the word woe is a warning of coming judgment, a declaration of doom, doom and destruction. It's telling that Isaiah doesn't point to someone else and say, Woe is he but rather he points to himself and says, Woe is me. When he sees the holiness of God, he confesses his own unholiness. Throughout uh, the previous chapters, 1 to 5, he pronounced woe on others. Woe to those, woe to those, woe to those. But now, face to face with God, it's woe is me. And then he says, I am ruined which means to be annihilated or destroyed. Oh, like the King James Version, it says, I am undone. Isaiah was so devastated by the holiness of God, he was starting to fall apart at the seams. And to me, it's like a child's teddy bear coming apart at the seams. Why? Because he saw, in an amazingly new way, God as holy. And for the first time in his life, he saw how unholy, how unlike God, he really was. John Calvin said that men are never duly touched and impressed with a conviction of their insignificance until they have confronted themselves with the majesty of God. As long as Isaiah could compare himself with with other mortals, as long as we can compare ourselves with those around us, we're able to sustain a higher opinion of ourselves, aren't we? But the instant that we measure ourselves by the the ultimate standard, the only standard, then we are morally and spiritually annihilated. The most important instrument of a prophet is his mouth. Seeing his own polluted depravity, Isaiah cries out, I am a man of unclean lips. I'm supposed to give God's message, but my mouth is vile. Jesus tells us that out of the overflow of our heart, our mouth speaks. Sadly, our hearts, we're told, are deceitful above all else. And so Isaiah's and our unclean unclean lips are a sign of something much bigger and much worse. Friends, no one can stand in the presence of God without becoming profoundly and devastatingly aware of their own wretched sinfulness. In other words, until we understand the holiness of God, we won't understand our own depravity, our own need for mercy. Um, You know, when you walk past or you're walking towards a room at night when a child is supposed to be asleep and there is a glow coming from under or around the door because the light's still on, well, to see even that smallest glimpse of God's holiness is to be destroyed and wiped out. Isaiah would never be the same again. Habakkuk says in chapter 3, verse 16, I heard and I trembled within. My lips quivered at the sound. Rottenness entered my bones. I trembled where I stood. When was the last time that you trembled and your heart pounded 
in the presence of God. If we can only see a portion, just a sliver under the door of what Isaiah saw, we would be changed forever. Some of us are bored with God because we don't understand who he really is. And because we don't understand who he is, we don't understand our own wretchedness, our own depravity. And so without owning our misery, we can't see our need for mercy, our dire need for mercy, our need to truly repent. Now look down at verse 6 and notice what happens at the very moment Isaiah owned his sin. Then, at the exact time Isaiah recognised his misery, mercy is set in motion. One of the seraphim flew to me and in his hand was a glowing coal that he had taken from the altar with tongs. But watch in verse 7, he touched my mouth with it and said, Now that this has touched your lips, your iniquity is removed. Your sin is atoned for. God does not leave Isaiah devastated. He does not leave us devastated. He, the only one who can, does something about it. Can you see Advent starting to appear in Isaiah chapter 6? This hot coal was taken from the altar where the sacrifices were offered. These foresee the deliverance that the final sacrifice, the Lamb of God, made as he laid down his life for us. Isaiah heard the praise of the seraphim and their thunderous song which shook the very foundation of the temple. But what did God hear? He heard the faint, fearful cry of a miserable man. When God hears Isaiah, he sends a seraph with a message of mercy. The Psalm 51 verse 7 reminds us that a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. Remember from chapters 1 to 5, God couldn't stand their sacrifices because they are only going through the motions. It had nothing to do with their heart and their attitude towards him. But a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. Now our lips are sensitive and tender and it is to that very part of the body that the angel places a hot coal and and sears the flesh. But salvation is always painful because it involves wrestling about who will ultimately be in control of our lives. And we don't like to give up. Grace is free, but it is not cheap. Well, Isaiah first saw the Lord's majesty. Then, as he was overcome with the misery of his own sinfulness, he experienced the Lord's mercy. Now, in verse 8, he accepts the Lord's mission. Then I heard the voice of the Lord asking, Who should I send? Who will go for us? I said, Here I am. Send me. In uh, other ancient Near East religions, only divine beings were sent as messengers of the gods. But our God, the God of the Bible, mostly uses human messengers. Great prophets like Isaiah, but people like you and me as well. In accepting the Lord's mission, Isaiah is first sensitive to his voice. I heard the voice of the Lord. Up to this point, he had seen the glory of God, he had heard the song of the seraphim, he had felt the burning coal upon his lips. Now, for the first time, he heard the voice of God. Suddenly, the angels were silent, and the voice that boomed through the temple echoed with piercing questions. Who should I send, and who will go for us? The Hebrew is in the plural, giving Old Testament suggestion, if not evidence, for the existence of the Trinity. And John 12 verse 41 says, When Isaiah saw the majesty of God, that he saw Jesus himself. John, speaking of Jesus, said, Isaiah said these things because he saw his glory and spoke of him. After being sensitive to the voice of God, Isaiah surrenders to his call. The last thing he declared was woe, but now he is ready to go. Notice Isaiah's immediate answer, here I am, send me. He's not so much giving God his location as he is surrendering to his calling. 
He's making himself available as an ambassador of Almighty God. By asking God to send him, he's demonstrating his unconditional surrender as a servant. And God is still looking for people who have been so moved by his majesty, for those who've experienced his mercy, that they are ready to join his mission. Uh, Now move down to verse 9 and notice the first part, go and say to this people. Well, he's told the message would not be received with gladness by the people. And in fact, for the most part, it won't be received at all. But that didn't stop him from going and giving it. Look at the rest of verse 9 and verse 10. Keep listening, but do not understand. Keep looking, but do not perceive. Make the minds of these people dull. Deafen their ears and blind their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes and hear with their ears, understand with their minds, turn back and be healed. That's not a message of blessing or of good news, is it? That is a message of judgment. By the power of God, Isaiah's words will cause the people to harden their hearts and stiffen their necks even more than they already are. And if verse 10 sounds familiar to you, it's quoted a couple of times in the New Testament, one that we had read for us. John quotes this passage in John 12 to explain why many did not believe in Jesus. Even though he had taught with authority and performed miracles that proved who he was, many didn't believe in him because this was a fulfilment of Isaiah's prophecy. But direct from the source in Mark 4, Jesus quotes from verse 10 when the disciples asked him why he is teaching in parables. He answered them, The secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you, but to those outside everything comes in parables. Well, one greater than Isaiah is here, and he is speaking judgment in the parables that he uses to teach. It's hard to get our heads around, and I think a few Bible studies have have struggled with it this week. But Jesus is saying that rather than the parables being helpful to understand God's truths, they are actually a form of judgment so that those outside of the kingdom won't understand. They'll look but not perceive. They'll listen but not understand because if they do, they might turn back and be forgiven. The hearts of those outside will continue to be hardened as they hear the word of God. We can certainly see evidence of that around us today, but it's nothing new, is it? In Isaiah's day, his preaching was proclaiming judgment on the people of God and his prophecy was proven after his death when Judah too was decimated like Israel and they were carried off to Babylon in exile. Like God told Isaiah, his preaching would make the people deaf, blind and dull, and they wouldn't turn back to God. And so they were whittled down to just a remnant. After the remnant returned, though they had a temple, nothing like the splendid one they had before, but they had no word from the Lord for 400 years, until John the Baptist came preaching in the desert. That's a long waiting. Chapter 6 closes with Isaiah waiting. How long, Lord? Until when, Lord? God answers with the results of the judgment that Isaiah proclaimed. The depressing warning of what will happen. Cities in ruins, houses without people, the land ruined, people driven far away, And even though a tenth remain, the land will be burned again. Isaiah is told that they won't listen to him and the result will be exile and a decimation of the land, the promised land. But apparently the terebinth is one of those trees that can look dead beyond all repair but can still produce a shoot. Isaiah is given a great promise here, isn't he? The Satan crusher that Eve was promised, the holy seed or offspring, the long for Messiah, who Isaiah goes on to make many more prophecies about, will rise up from the remnant that is left in the burnt and decimated land of Israel. Not the land as such, but from the people. David's line. All that is left is a cut off and burnt stump, a remnant 
of just one. And we need to be reminded of that promise too, don't we? If the great prophet Isaiah, chosen and sent by God himself, cannot face up to God, then what hope have we got? And if the sinless seraphim ever present with the Almighty have to cover their faces from his glory, how can we possibly stand before him? Well, do you know that something similar happened about 700 years later? There was an earthquake. The temple was shaken. Its doorposts were shaken so much that the curtain was torn in two because God came down. Matthew 27.45 says, From noon to three in the afternoon, darkness came over the land. Jesus cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And when he cried out again, he gave up his spirit. At that very moment, the curtain in the sanctuary was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth quaked. The rocks were split. And do you remember the night before when Jesus prayed in the garden? I am grieved even to the point of death. What's he saying? Woe is me. I feel like I'm coming apart. But not because... He is a man of unclean lips, but because he was needing sustenance, because he was obedient to his father. He was taking our punishment as a people of unclean lips and hearts and minds. But no angel turned up with a glowing coal to say, your iniquity is removed, your sin is atoned for, because Jesus was the sacrifice on the coal, on the altar, Jesus was shaken by the judgment of God. Jesus is now the judge of the world. But the first time he came, he came to bear judgment for you and for me. He was shaken by God's judgment so that we could be unshakable, so that our iniquity could be removed, so that our sin could be atoned for. While Isaiah waited, he preached God's word. He waited for the outcome of God's judgment, for a remnant that would lead to salvation. How do we wait? Christ's return is mentioned at least 318 times in the New Testament. Make no mistake, Jesus is coming back. While we are waiting, we are to be watching for him. Blessed will be those servants the master finds alert when he comes. We mustn't get caught up in the things that dominate the minds and hearts of unbelievers of the world around us, such as important things like what will we eat and drink and wear. But we should seek above all else the rule and reign of Jesus in our own lives. Second, we should be ready to go. Let me ask you, if Jesus came back today, would you be ready to go? Ready to go with him? If you're not living in a way that is pleasing to him because you love him, then his return is going to come as a great shock and a surprise to you. You won't be alert when he comes. Third, we should want to become more like Jesus every day. Um, according to 2 Peter 3 that Elizabeth read for us, it is clear what sort of people you should be in holy conduct and godliness as you wait for the day of God and hasten its coming. While you wait for these things, make every effort to be found without spot or blemish in his sight at peace. And finally, we should anxiously wait his return. Have you ever been looking forward to seeing someone? You wait for the sound of that person's car in the driveway? You rip open the door before they can even knock. That's what it means to wait anxiously for Jesus to return. So it's my prayer that this Advent season you will see over and over again that glorious holiness of God. Read chapter 6 every day if you need to. That you will be undone by how far you fall short. But that you will see Jesus as the one, the only one, who can bridge the gap and that you'll be watching and anxiously waiting for his second advent.